Good afternoon. My name is Ben Greenstone, and I'm going to talk about politics, policy, and video games. So a very quick bit of background on me and why I'm speaking about this. Um, I'm the director of TASO Advisory. We're a public policy and public affairs consultancy for uh, businesses primarily in the creative industries with a particular specialism in video games. Um, we work with businesses to help them manage their policy, political and regulatory risk and to find and exploit opportunities. Before I did this, I worked as a chief advisor to government ministers uh, with a particular responsible for digital and the creative industries. So I've seen and worked on this process from both sides. I'm going to start by giving a bit of a summary uh, on the history and the present of the relationship between video games, politics and policy, and then I'll run through some of the current issues and why they should matter to video games businesses. And I'll finish briefly by talking about what businesses can do. So let's begin with, uh, so that's what we're going to talk about, let's begin with Space Invaders. Um, in 1978, the game hit arcades in Japan and soon spread across the rest of the world. It was a huge hit. People loved to play it, happily spending their pocket money or their paper round earnings uh, on another go at the high score. But it wasn't popular with everyone. In 1981, the Member of Parliament for South Ayrshire, George Fuchs, introduced the Control of Space Invaders Bill to the House of Commons. He was convinced that game, the game made too many young people, in his words, play truant, miss meals, and give up other normal activities. Even worse, he said, children were taking money out of their parents' purses to have another go. Again, in his words, it was blood money extracted from children's weakness. And he wanted to use licensing and planning rules uh, to make it harder to operate the machines in the United Kingdom. He was unsuccessful, but if he was successful, that would clearly have dented the ability of the product to make money in the UK and indeed to bring joy to the players who liked getting a high score. George Fuchs wasn't alone in that ambition. A year later, in 1982, uh, city officials in Boston took matters into their own hands. They started by refusing to grant licenses to stores in residential areas that wanted to operate an arcade, machines, an arcade machine. They called them electric blights. Parents were complaining about their children skipping school and stealing money to go and have a game at the arcade or at the local laundromat, uh, where also arcade machines were operating. So there was this political incentive to concede to the moral panic uh, from parents, ignoring the lack of any real evidence that arcade games were to blame for anything at all. The relationship between video games and politics started off rocky, and despite a couple of outliers, it hasn't really got a whole lot better. Last year, President Trump referred to several popular games as having influenced the perpetrators of tragic school shootings, despite no evidence that that was the case. Closer to home, a group of MPs in our parliament have released a report on what they called immersive and addictive technologies. They singled out the games industry for particular criticism, saying that they had struggled to get clear and useful information on how the industry was protecting its players and users from harms. So what? Who cares if a few people who probably don't play games don't enjoy them or understand them or, or think that they're bad for society? The problem is that these people who think those things are also the people who get to make the rules and the regulations uh, that this industry has to operate in. Happily, like I said, George Fuchs's attempt to limit the number of Space Invaders arcade machines in the UK was unsuccessful. But Parliament and policymakers can damage reputations and bottom lines if they set their sights on an industry or practice. So it's really important to know what government and policymakers are thinking. So I'll now run through some of uh, the big current issues that affect the games industry. So governments and politicians generally, and particularly in the UK, are thinking in terms of three broad categories of harm that relate to video games. These are social harms, financial harms, and data harms. There are really, within those three broad categories, three other bits of work that are ongoing that relate to them. The first is that select committee I just mentioned. This group of MPs hauled representatives of games businesses to Parliament and asked them questions about how they prevented players from spending too much or playing for too long. 
confronted with the entirely reasonable response that reality is more shades of grey than black or white, and that, for example, some people's too much was other people's perfectly easily expendable income, the committee released a damning report with some pretty tough recommendations for government. These recommendations included things like regulating loot boxes as gambling and requiring companies to share their aggregated player data with researchers and to then pay for any ensuing research that those researchers wanted to do. The committee and their report are broadly concerned with all three types of those harms. The second big bit of work that is the government's online harms white paper. Online harms is government shorthand for anything bad that happens online. But for the purposes of this white paper, financial harms are excluded. The white paper proposes new regulations around user-generated content and harm prevention. For context, that will include games with chat functions and will have fines for failure to comply. These fines could well be in line with GDPR. So for context, if Facebook were to break the rules, they'd be looking at a maximum fine in the region of $2.2 billion. And even for Mark Zuckerberg, that might sting a bit. The third big bit of work going on in the UK at the moment is the Information Commissioner's Age Appropriate Design Code. The Information Commissioner's Office is the UK's independent data regulator. And the code that they've proposed is a set of standards that developers of information society services must follow if the service is likely to be accessed by children. Controversially, it calls for things like mandatory age verification of on all online users to check if they are children or not, and then to age gate on that basis. That, of course, has major implications for any game that's available in the UK. Let's say you make a free-to-play mobile game that is mostly intended for adults, but which children might reasonably access. The code would require you to either age verify all users when they play, or, and deny access below a certain age, or to make your game suitable for a three-year-old, or potentially to release a different version of the game in the UK market. So in the context of these three big pieces of work, let's look at how they interact with the three broad categories of harm that we mentioned. So social harms. By social harms, politicians and government are interested in how we interact with others and how we live our lives, particularly in ways that aren't related to our financial well-being. When it comes to games, governments and politicians are especially interested in ideas of addiction, abuse, playtime, and bullying. Society has always worried about technology. It's not new. There were once upon a time articles about the negative impact of radio on children. Most parents today would be delighted if their children spent their Sunday mornings listening to Desert Island Discs. And I'm sure I wasn't the only person in this room who was told that their eyes would turn square if they watched too much television. What we're seeing is the same with video games. The DCMS Select Committee quizzed companies on why they did not set standard limits for the amount of time children could play. The World Health Organization has added gaming disorder into its international classification of diseases. And the Children's Commissioner has reported on the alleged bullying that children suffer if they don't have the right skin on Fortnite. So there's a very real risk that if politicians perceive games to be a bad thing, both for individuals and for society as a whole, that it could lead to badly informed regulation that damages the functioning of the industry, like mandated maximum playtimes or age gating of services. All of these add administrative, administrative and, as a result, financial burdens onto businesses in this industry with no obvious benefit to the user or to society. So on to financial harms. When we talk about financial harms, politicians and government are interested in how something impacts our financial and monetary well-being. Are we spending too much and are we prioritising the right things? Particularly when it comes to games, there are concerns around spending controls and gambling or gambling-like mechanics. We've all seen articles about children getting hold of their parents' credit cards and spending money they shouldn't on new skins or extra lives for their favourite games. And we'll also have read criticisms of businesses not doing anything when that happens, not refunding, for instance. So again, the DCMS Select Committee went really heavy on this. And on the nature of the in-game transactions in questions, particularly the random element of loot boxes. Indeed, the recommendation to the government was to legislate to have loot boxes regulated in the same way as more traditional forms of gambling. 
If the government accepts this recommendation, it would mandate the removal of loot boxes from any game for under 18s and require developers to apply for gambling licenses. For some developers, that might hurt their margins. For others, it would, of course, completely wipe them out. And so on to the final kind of harms, data harms. Um, these harms are, in the minds of politicians and government, the kind of harms that came to light after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. The questions being asked are, what do businesses know about us and how are they using that? And of special interest when it comes to video games, what data are collected on children and how is it used? This, again, was squarely in the sights of that DCMS Select Committee. Uh, and has been a key driver of the Information Commissioner's Age Appropriate Design Code. Although, ironically, the Commissioner's proposed solution is to collect more data rather than less. The Select Committee concluded that data on playtime and habits are collected by games companies for their own commercial purposes, but that businesses are willfully obtuse in sharing that. The committee believed that data harms played into social harms via what they called designed addiction. Their recommendation was that developers should be required to adhere to a behavioural uh, design code of practice and that the new regulator for online harms that the government will shortly be introducing should oversee that. We see again this administrative and financial burden placed on developers and an industry with no obvious proof that this will help either the user or indeed society more broadly. And that's a summary of the really big issues. There's a lot more going on besides this. So I mentioned the Children's Commissioner uh, and her report on the impact of games on children. The Economic and Social Research Council has just funded uh, some, some research into uh, the link between video games and gambling. And the Competitions and Market Authority, as well as the government, are exploring uh, the digital advertising market. And I haven't even mentioned Brexit because, A, you might have heard about it earlier, but, B, it's really an issue for the entire economy and not something really specific to the games industry. But simply put, there's a really significant amount of political and regulatory risk for the games industry at the moment. And I'm sorry that I've spoken about such doom and gloom so early into the PGC London programme. But despite what looks like a pretty hostile environment, there are some positives. There are things that businesses can do both individually and collectively to protect themselves against this risk and indeed to seize some opportunities. So I know I haven't spoken a huge amount about opportunities, but if we think about that DCMS Select Committee, a DCMS Select Committee, no matter how hostile talking about video games, gives government the license to think about games and uh, what they can do to make the industry more successful in the UK. That's a good opportunity for businesses to talk to government about the things that matter to your business. So what can you do? The first thing is to monitor and assess. Keep up to date with political opinion and consider if and how you need to respond, either as an individual, as a business, or as an industry. But also assess your own practices as you go. Are there things that you could do better? Or indeed, are there things that you do really well? And this leads to the second thing. Show government and politicians and policy makers what you do well, and ideally show them with evidence and numbers. Lobbying and campaigning can so often be thought of as a dark art, but this is really all it is. Show government your good work, educate them on your industry, and explain how some proposals would do more harm than good. And the third and probably the most important thing that any industry can do in its engagement with government and creating a regulatory system that works for it is to offer government and politicians solutions. Government has only so many people and politicians have only so much bandwidth. They want to be able to show progress and demonstrate positive impact that takes the heat off them. So offering solutions that are workable for the, for, uh, for the industry is a fantastic way of effectively mitigating regulatory and political risk. You might be big enough that you have some in-house capacity to do that, but you may well not be. So consider joining a trade body or, you know, indeed, working with an agency to tell your own story. And I'm very happy to talk to anyone, hear about their business risks and opportunities and what the right course of action might be for them. And ultimately, we're all here because we know the hugely positive impact of video games on individuals and on societies, and we'd like to see more of it. Thank you very much for listening, and I think we've now got time for some questions. Sorry.
slightly early. It's good. It's just it's always a terrible problem to be early. So, um, yes, do we have questions? There's a lot of issues covered there, um, a lot of kind of uh, different topics to sort of talk about. There's a gentleman there. We've got, we've got a good five to ten minutes, so we can uh, take it easy. You can, you can extrapolate. Sorry, this is perhaps a bit of a long-winded one. But, good. Um, <laughs> I, I think you, you mentioned kind of the hostility of the, the DCMS inquiry, but... Yep. And I, I agree, they, they were quite hostile. I watched every single one of those um, verbal evidence-giving sessions. But also, like, it was an opportunity for the games industry to prove itself and be accountable and answer those questions. And at no point throughout that process did I see the games industry saying, we do recognize these problems, we are aware. It was very defensive. I mean, they just, the DCMS described them as willfully obtuse. They said mm -hmm. it was a very obvious lack of transparency and honesty. And I feel like the games industry has kind of dug this hole itself a little bit. I'm just wondering what your, what your view is on that. So uh, I would disagree that the games industry has dug the hole itself. I think that, I think two things. I think first of all, that going in front of a select committee is a really difficult thing. Um, it is not an everyday situation and that committee, I think, had made its mind up before it got any businesses in front of it. So its line of questioning was always quite aggressive and quite hard to offer any actual help towards. The second thing I think, though, is that you're right. There would have been more that could have been done. And a big part of how you do that is you prepare and you think about what the committee might want to ask and you think about how to do it. And I think that's a skill that's that's not kind of, it's not obvious, it's not naturally imbued. You get it by having done it before or having worked in that place before. And I think, honestly, that games businesses probably could have done more to work with their trade body or with others to prepare for those sessions. I mean, these were big game companies, though. Like, they're not sort of small indie developers who don't know what they're doing. These are like big, giant corporations who have to deal with lawmakers and regulators on a regular basis. So to kind of say that they just weren't prepared or didn't know what they were doing feels like kind of giving them a bit of a free pass for kind of screwing it up quite badly, I think. I think we've seen lots of really big businesses in recent times, not just in the games industry, that have got very big very quickly and all of a sudden have to answer to regulators and lawmakers and make a bit of a hash of it the first time round. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I, t I take that point wholeheartedly. I think that there were actually some really good examples in that select committee. So for instance, I actually think that King gave a really good account of themselves, had come with answers and data, thought about what they needed to talk about, and done that within some of the, the other legal confines. So for instance, they're a listed business, right? They, they have to deal, they, you know, they can't give out all their data in a select committee without notifying. Sorry, to managing two things at once. Um, cool, any further questions we have out there? About, there's a chap with a hat there, very nice. Hello, yes, I am wearing a hat. Uh, Congratulations. <laughs> you spoke a little while ago about the prospect of regulations. Have you given any thought to the picture in China and whether those form of regulations would be appealing uh, to UK government or Europe at large? Yeah, so, um, of course, lots of what happens in China is... Uh, kind of looked on at by the rest of the world because it's a huge market for so many businesses and so uh, other countries look to kind of either align or not on the basis of making themselves an obvious second market. I have certainly heard politicians talk about some, some of China's proposed regulations and also, for instance, the Cinderella law uh, that limits when younger people can play games, particularly during uh, kind of late evening to early morning. But I'd be really surprised if Western economies, certainly the kind of in, in the EU's broad regulatory market and indeed in the US regulatory market, went in that direction, partly because they're cut by the double-edged sword of wanting businesses to know less about all of their customers and to hold less data, and part of how you can do some of the kind of the regulation that China has done, essentially, is because it knows everything about its citizens. Uh, so while they do think about it, sometimes I'd be really surprised if they went as far as you've seen China go. Um, I think they have an appetite in the UK, certainly, for uh, limiting 
the amount of information this is collected, particularly on children. And I think that that then precludes them from what they then have, what they would like to do, which is to, to limit playtime. But I think that that's a lesser goal for them than limiting the amount of data that's collected. Cool. I have just one question just to finish, because I, I caught some of it when I was running about. Um, you obviously raised a number of issues that I saw. If, if you're a, a sort of a game developer publisher right now, it's very hard to keep up with everything. You know, obviously, you want to be mm. compliant with laws. I get that. But what do you think is the biggest threat or the biggest you must do this of the different sort of legal issues either now or coming down the, the line? Uh, so aside from Brexit, which obviously don't, don't, ev don't. every business needs to be well, keeping We have had three years prepare, as David told us, even <laughs> though we don't know what we're preparing for. So yeah, we're yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so aside, aside from that, for me, I think the really big thing to think about is loot boxes, loot. actually. Um, you've got the age-appropriate design code coming, and that's actually due to be released at some stage this week uh, in its final form. But I think that the most immediate threat to lots of games businesses... Uh, financial, financials essentially on bottom lines. If that stops, yeah. exactly. If, if all of a sudden you're not allowed to have in-game transactions of some kind without having a license, a betting license, that's a big deal. I think that's a big deal to think about. Cool. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Can a round of applause, please, for for Ben? Thank you. Thanks.